Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. My name is Dr. Steven Roth and I'm a board certified oral and maxillofacial pathologist and today as I'm filming this is July 1st which means the start of a new residency adventure for many of the new residents out there. So I figured that with today's video it might be best to do a review of histology. So today I'll be talking about various histologic stains in addition to various words that we use to describe slides. And then finally a discussion about what may make something malignant versus benign. It'll be a nice review for everyone that's just starting out with histology. But first, I have to get into the disclaimer, and that is that all of the views expressed in this video are mine and mine alone, and do not represent any professional organization that might employ me or that I may belong to, and that this is meant for educational purposes only, and not as medical advice. Should you have any questions about your oral health, I suggest that you seek out your nearest oral health care provider. And with that being said, let's get into the video. So as pathologists, it is our task to look at disease. And there's a few ways to do that. The first being grossly, which is to look at an entire specimen taken from a body to figure out what the disease looks like at a macroscopic or eye level. And then there's also the microscopic or histopathologic. And that is what I'll be focusing on on this video. And we'll start with the most common stain, and that is the H and E or hematoxylin and eosin stain. The H and E stain, which I'll be referring to it as H and E stain from now on, is a combination of two stains, hematoxylin and eosin. It is far and away the most common stain that we encounter as pathologists, and it has two different colors, uh, red, which is eosin, and blue, which is hematoxylin. Hematoxylin is derived from the heartwood of the logwood tree, and combined with an aluminum salt, it dyes things blue. Now, it's important to go back to our middle school science talking about acids and bases. Remember that bases are positively charged and acids are negatively charged. That leads these two to be attracted to one another, a positive and a negative coming together to merge in balance. Hematoxylin itself is basic, meaning that it is positively charged. That means that it's going to die or attach to negative structures or acids. And in a cell, the acids are DNA and RNA, dioxyribose nucleic acid and ribose nucleic acid. Acid is right there in the name. And what makes them acids are the phosphate group as part of their bases. And you can see that right here, that the phosphate groups cause these acids to be negatively charged. That means that the positively charged hematoxylin stain is going to be attracted to these molecules. And that's why hematoxylin tends to be attracted to DNA and RNA, causing the nuclei of the cell, where a lot of DNA is held, to be stained blue. Eosin, on the other hand, is an acid, meaning it's, char it's charged negatively and it's attracted to positively charged ions. In the case of the cell and what we look at under the microscope, this is often a protein. Now remember that proteins are comprised of amino acids, and amino acids are often positively charged due to their side chains. This means that a lot of the extracellular proteins and the collagen and a lot of the other proteins that we see in the body are going to look red when stained with hematoxylin and eosin. Now hydrophobic structures such as fat often get lost during processing and so they're going to appear optically clear without hematoxylin or eosin staining on the slide. So what happens when you have an H&E slide? you get something that looks like this, a nice combination of red and blue. And I would say probably 99% of the slides that pathologists look like are stained with H&E. 
There are, however, some special stains, and that means that instead of getting stained with H&E, it gets stained with another substance, uh, another stain that, that highlights different structures. Um, the most common that we probably see is the PAS, or periodic acid shift. And we use this to look most commonly for fungi, and it really highlights the cellular structure of the fungi. PAS can also be used to highlight glycogen and to highlight the basement membrane, and it has a, a lot of different uses, but in oral pathology, we use it a lot to identify fungi. Gramathionine silver, or GMS, is also a good fungal stain, and that will be uh, cause the fungi to look more black. Mucicarmine is another special stain, and that stains mucin, and we use it sometimes in, in cysts that might have mucus cells, or a mucoepidermoid carcinoma, which is a cancer that has mucus cells, and that stains mucus red. A interesting fact about the mucicarmine stain is that it actually is derived from carmine, which is a substance derived from pulverized cochineal beetles. Now, a different type of staining technique is immunohistochemistry. And we use immunohistochemistry if we're not certain what type of cell we're looking at. Different cells have different structures to them. So that means that they have different genes in the nucleus, they might have different proteins in the cytoplasm, or they might have different surface markers on the cell membrane around the outside. So immunohistochemistry, or IHC, which I'll be calling it from now on, is a targeted approach to help us identify what type of cell we're looking at. How IHC works, it takes an antibody that's something that is produced by the immune system that is specifically trained to target a specific site on a specific type of cell. So that might be a gene, that might be a protein, or it might be a surface marker. The antibody then goes and attaches to that target and is stuck there. Now these targeted antibodies are made in uh, lab animals such as rabbits or goats or cows and that is really helpful because the antibodies themselves won't show up under the microscope. We have to then take a second antibody that is targeted against the cow or the goat or the rabbit and attaches onto it. This kind of antibody tower will have a pigment attached to it. The anti-goat or anti-rabbit antibody will appear usually brown, and that will allow us to view that target. So again, we have our, our target, which could be a gene or a protein or a membrane surface marker that is attached with an antibody. And then a second antibody with pigment attaches to that one and it creates this antibody tower that we can then see under the microscope as brown. Now, depending on the target, that's what will light up. So if it's a gene, then the nucleus will be brown. If it's a protein, then the cytoplasm will be brown. If it's a surface marker, then the membrane will be brown. One example of this that I really like is SOX10 which will label neural and neural crest cells, and it is a nuclear stain because SOX10 is a gene. So all of the nuclei affected with or containing SOX10 will appear brown when stained with SOX10 IHC. Now, kind of a variant on IHC is direct immunofluorescence, or DIF. And DIF is reserved for certain autoimmune conditions that affect the epithelium. Most commonly for us, it is pemphigoid and pemphigus. In these conditions, the patient's own body is producing antibodies that are attacking the surface of their epithelium wrongfully. And in order to diagnose it, we have to figure out exactly where these antibodies are attacking the body. Similar to IHC, the initial antibody is created by the person's own immune system. 
We then take a labeled antibody with a uh, special type of label that will light up under a certain special microscope to see which of the patient's antibodies are attached to what structures. This is also used in kidney samples, but I'm not too familiar with that process. Uh, I do know that it's certain autoimmune kidney conditions, but for us, it's mostly in epithelial diseases that are autoimmune. If uh, a direct immunofluorescence or DIF study is to be performed, it must be done on either fresh tissue that was biopsied and gathered within the past 10 minutes or so, or tissue placed in a special type of fixative called Michelle's solution. And either way, that prevents the patient's own antibodies from being washed away. We have to make sure that the antibodies are there so that our fluorescent tags can attach to them, kind of like a sandwich from the IHC, but instead looking at the patient's own rather than an artificial target that was grown in a different lab animal. So I know that was a little complex and hopefully I didn't muddy the waters more, but we're going to transition into the next part of the video, which are common adjectives that you may hear when describing a cell under the microscope. Now, the first way to describe a cell or a collection of cells is the color. So instead of saying red and blue, we like to be a little bit fancy. So we use eosinophilic for red. That means that what we're looking at likes eosin or loves eosin. It's an eosin lover, eosinophile. Eosinophilic is red. On the opposite end, basophilic is blue. Now, why they don't call it hematoxophilic? Probably because basophilic has less syllables in it, but basophilic means that the structure we're looking at, that blue structure, likes the base, loves the base, and so it's going to look blue. Some other adjectives that we use compare what we're looking at to what we expect to see. So pleomorphic is an important word that means different from expected or different types. So you can have pleomorphic mitosis, meaning that the mitoses look different, pleomorphic cells, which means that the cells look different, or pleomorphic structure, which means that the structure is comprised of different patterns or different cell types. Atypical is a way to say different from typical or different from normal. And then finally, a special word that we use when the nuclei looks very, very dark blue is hyperchromatic. That means that there is a lot of chromatin that is collecting that blue stain in the nucleus. And this means that the nucleus is probably pretty active and dividing and creating a lot of extra chromatin. Now, how do we know if something is malignant or cancerous? And there are a few signs that are very helpful in figuring out if something is malignant. These include hypercellularity, meaning are there more cells than we expect to see in that area? Are the cells dividing so much that they're kind of taking over? Hyperchromatic, which I spoke about before, if a cell is creating extra chromatin and we don't necessarily expect it to be, that means that it's getting ready to divide. And if something is dividing out of control, then it may be cancer, it may be malignant. Invasion, that means cells going where they're not supposed to be, that is definitely a sign of cancer. That means that these cells have changed and are starting to spread and be where they don't belong. High mitotic rate or atypical mitosis. Now cells divide. That's something that, that we know. It's something that we learn in our middle school science courses. But when cells are dividing too rapidly or they're dividing in kind of a weird way that looks different from our, our textbook pictures of mitosis, that is a uh, very good sign that what we're looking at might be malignant. If we see sheeting, which means that the entire scan that we're looking at looks like the same cell type, then that might mean that it is a clonal proliferation, meaning that the cells are creating twins of themselves, clones of themselves, and kind of taking over. 
And then finally, necrosis. And necrosis means that this, the cells are dead. It's, it's dead debris. If cells are dividing too rapidly and can't support themselves with nutrients and oxygen and blood, then they're going to die. If we see a lot of necrosis, then we might be concerned about malignancy. I think that this picture that I have uh, over here is a really good example of all of these features of malignancy where alarm bells might be going off that this is a malignant process. So there you have it, your overview of histology and histologic stains. To everyone beginning their new residency journey today, I wish you good luck. And those that have stumbled across this video, I hope that you found it helpful. If you did, please share it with someone else that may find it helpful as well. Don't forget to like and subscribe and be well.